Good afternoon. Welcome. We'll just give one minute for folks to come in and then we'll get started. Okay, good afternoon. I'm Keegan McChesney, a program officer on LISC's National Rural Team. Our team works with and through approximately 150 partners that are transforming rural communities in more than 2,400 counties across 49 states and Puerto Rico. Welcome to this installment of Raising the Roof. Through this webinar series, we seek to share innovations, trends, best practices, and thought leadership from our industry colleagues as we work together to create quality, affordable housing opportunities. Everyone deserves a place to call home, yet homelessness is on the rise in many communities across America. According to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, the number of people experiencing homelessness in the U.S. rose by less than 1% from 2020 to 2022, but those in rural continuums of care saw an increase of nearly 6%. Today, we'll be discussing All In, the federal strategic plan to prevent and end homelessness, a new multi-year interagency blueprint for a future where no one experiences the tragedy and indignity of homelessness, and everyone has a safe, accessible, and affordable place to call home. All webinar attendees have been muted, However, we welcome your questions, so please submit them via the Q&A function. I'll pose as many of them to our speakers as time allows. Now I'd like to introduce today's presenters. Joe N. Savage Jr., PhD, is a senior regional advisor at the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness. Our second presenter, Paige Looney, is a housing policy specialist at West Virginia Coalition to End Homelessness. Dr. Savage, the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much, uh, Keegan. I'm certainly glad to be here uh, with you all once again. And I'm just gonna jump right into my presentation. I'm going to give you all a brief overview of All In, the new federal strategic plan to uh, prevent and end homelessness. Um, I'm one of five senior regional advisors at USICH in our role. We really help communities implement um, federal policy as it relates to homelessness. So as Policies are developed at the federal level, such as the strategic plan, as well as other policies that might come out of other federal agencies. We help communities understand what does implementation look like at the local level for our specific uh, community. And so that's what we do as senior regional advisors. I cover the mid-Atlantic and southeastern states. And when I'm done with my presentation, I'm going to put a link in the chat box where you can go and look up the senior regional advisor that covers the particular um, state that your organization agency um, is located in. Um, in terms of how we got here in developing the federal strategic plan, we did a number of listening sessions and we were very intentional about getting key uh, stakeholders and making sure that we included the voice and the um, perspectives of people with lived experience. After our listening sessions concluded, we also had an online portal where anyone from the community could give us input. So we ended up with over 3,500 lines of qualitative data that we used as input for the development um, of this plan. And so in that input, some of the biggest challenges that we heard, of course, lack of housing support. I don't think anything on this list is going to be um, a surprise to anyone in terms of the significant challenges that most communities um, face and that they express during our uh, listening session. And one of the big ones that's sort of on the rise is that second to last one, the criminalization of homelessness. We really heard uh, repeatedly and we're actually seeing that um, on the rise uh, recently as it relates to um, unsheltered homelessness. And then also, as far as the greatest opportunities were can expressed, we know that um, American Rescue Plan dollars, CARES Act dollars, as well as appropriations in the president's FY23 budget were significant. And these resources, particularly um, American Rescue Plan, 
one-time resources that communities may never see again. And we were really emphasizing that communities take the ball and run as far as possible with these resources so that they can maximize um, their outcomes while they're um, particularly available. You guys will get a copy of these slides. I don't want to go through um, these individually because I want to get through this and get to our next presentation uh, from Paige and then have time for um, Q&A. So as far as some basic numbers are concerned, this is the point in time count numbers from 2010 to 2022. 2010 is when we released the first federal strategic plan, which was opening doors. As you can see, we see an overall decrease in homelessness of 33%. That uptick in chronic homelessness has been primarily in uh, coastal cities, particularly on the West Coast, where the cost of housing is just simply um, skyrocketing in this extremely unaffordable family homelessness down by 36%. And that number for veterans is really, really important. We were able to make significant progress with veterans because Congress put up the resources through such programs as HUD VASH, the voucher program, as well as rental subsidies, shallow subsidies through um, supportive services for veterans and their families or SSVF. And the point that I like to emphasize with this number is that when Congress puts up the resources, we can make significant progress in um, reducing homelessness. And we don't have the youth number because the base year for uh, youth homelessness that we've been using is the uh, 2017 point in time count. Hold on, I lost my screen here. All right, so as far as the new federal strategic plan, it's called All In, that's the, a short name for it, and you can certainly go to our website, www.usich.gov forward slash all dash in, and you can download a copy of the plan, and I encourage you to do that and uh, read through the plan. One of the key features of the plan is we have set a goal of reducing homelessness by 25% by 2025, with 2022 being the base year. So we're using the January 2022 point in time count as the starting point. And this um, three-year cycle will end with the January 2025 point in time count. And we're seeking a 25% reduction overall in homelessness. And we are encouraging communities to also set this goal at the local level. And if they want to set a goal that's even higher and be even more ambitious, that's perfectly fine. But we want communities to also set their own ambitious goal in terms of reductions in homelessness by uh, 2025, with 2022 being that base year. Um, in terms of subpopulations, one of the things you'll notice about All In, uh, we didn't break it out by subpopulation as we've done in the past, and that's because we're using what's called um, universal targeting, and essentially what that's about is rather than having specific goals for specific subpopulations, we want communities to target all populations. However, based on their local data, if they find that they really have the resources to really drive homelessness down with a particular subpopulation, then they can target that subpopulation towards their reduction by 2025. So you'll read about that um, term in the federal strategic plan, universal targeting, because we chose not to do it by subpopulation, but it's a universal reduction but communities can use their local data to see if perhaps targeting a specific subpopulation would be beneficial to them based on their resources. So All In has three foundational pillars, equity, data, and evidence, and collaboration. And then it has three solution pillars, housing and services, crisis response, and prevention. So when we talk about those foundational pillars, at that first one, lead with equity, racial equity has been embedded throughout this plan and prior strategic plans, racial equity was a section in the plan, but with this plan, it's embedded throughout the plan. And then the plan is based upon the fact that, and we specifically call out the impact that racism and discrimination, institutional uh, racism and discrimination has had on leading to the disparate impacts of homelessness that we see today. So it's embedded throughout the um, plan. And then we want communities to use data and evidence to really drive and target um, their resources. And then that last one is very um, important, collaboration at all levels. We have taken an all of government approach when it comes to addressing homelessness. And you may have heard that term 
um, out of HUD or HHS, the Department of Education, we recognize that it takes all of government to address this issue. And we want communities to adopt an all of community approach. That means not just homeless service providers, but CDCs, CBOs, partnering, make sure proper people from local government are at the table, but really using a strategically aligned all of community approach so that those resources can be maximized and used uh, most efficiently. So these are the three foundational pillars. And when you read the plan, each of these pillars have strategies associated with them. So when we go to the uh, solution pillars, um, scale up housing and supports, improved homelessness response and uh, prevent homelessness. Again, each of these solution pillars um, has strategies associated with it. Key to this plan is the inclusion of prevention. Prior plans really did not have an emphasis on prevention, but we wanted to emphasize prevention in this plan because we can have all of the solutions we want to exit people out of homelessness, but if we don't turn off the faucet, then we'll actually, we'll get nothing done. And so prevention is a key pillar um, in this plan. So in terms of implementation, we are in the process of um, setting forth milestones and the actions that we will um, take to implement this plan. Understand that we um, imagine this plan to be fluid not only will we publish um, annual performance management results, but we will adjust the plan annually based on additional feedback that we get from communities, as well as what we're seeing um, in terms of the data and the outcomes. So we do want you all to view this plan as a evolving document that's going to change over time, that's gonna be supplemented over time um, based on data and based on um, the metrics um, that we establish. In terms of how we'll measure progress, these are just some of the initial data points, um, overall size of the homeless population. We're gonna be continue to monitor uh, the racial disparities. We're gonna look at things such as length of time homelessness, as well as returns to homelessness within those two time periods that are listed, as well as first time homelessness, um, helping us to um, measure um, prevention efforts. And so these are just some of the data points that we're going to be using that will be published in our performance management plan to um, assess our progress. And then we are encouraging communities to look at their local plan and use this as an opportunity to either develop or revise or update their local plan to reflect what's in the federal strategic plan. That alignment is very important because we released the plan in December, upcoming um, notice of funding opportunities and various grants that will be coming out at the federal level. A lot of the scoring is going to be based on some of the priorities that are in the federal strategic plan. And the closer a community's plan is in alignment to the federal strategic plan, the better they will score in those um, funding opportunities. So we're really encouraging communities to look at their local plans and again, really use that all of community approach and making sure that not just homeless service providers are at the table, but affordable housing development um, partnerships, as well as those who are even in um, the development of housing, even if it's workforce housing, but making sure all of those partners are um, at the table. So these last couple of slides, I just wanna point out where is rural homelessness emphasized in the federal strategic plan? Number one, it was identified in the challenges when it comes down to accessing services, the availability of services, the creation of long wait lists, simply because the capacity isn't there. And it was called out in that feedback that this is a particular issue experienced by rural communities. In our de definition of equity um, in the plan, we have identified these uh, consistent and systemic fair justice and impartial treatment of all individuals. And that includes, as you see at the bottom, persons who live in rural areas. So we are recognizing the disparities that exist in persons that are living in uh, rural areas. And so as far as the foundational pillar, use data and evidence to make decisions, strategy number two under this pillar specifically calls out um, strengthening the capacity of state and local governments and um, organizations. And under this strategy, we are have committed to engage in efforts to identify more ways of collecting data on 
and subpopulations that are um, particularly undercounted, including families living in rural areas. That was something that we heard in the feedback. So we're making sure that the data collection is improved for families living in rural areas. The solution pillar, improve effectiveness of homelessness response system, strategy number four, calls out rural homelessness, where we're going to work with communities, and that particularly be in my work as a senior regional um, advisor to make sure that COCs are being encouraged, especially in rural areas, to have an inclusive community crisis response plan. And again, having CDCs and CBOs and other community-based organizations as a part of the crisis response plan is very key to that all of community approach. And then uh, the solution pillar, preventing homelessness, strategy number three, where we talk about reducing housing instability. Uh, USICH, we have been uh, committed to providing technical assistance to states and local governments, as well as providing housing related supports. And we specifically call out rural communities in our efforts to um, implement this uh, particular um, strategy. So finally, um, this is where you can go to download a copy of All In. I encourage you to download and read it. And again, I'm going to post in the chat box the link that you can use to contact your uh, senior regional advisor. And we're there to help you understand what these federal priorities are, what role you can play, and what implementation can look like at the local level. So I'll turn it back to you, Keegan. Thank you so much, Joe. You really covered a robust plan in record time. So appreciate your, your insight and calling out specifically some of the challenges and opportunities in rural communities. Um, if you have any questions for Dr. Savage, please submit them in the chat or Q&A. We'll be doing some Q&A after Paige's presentation. And without further ado, Paige, I will pass the floor to you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. You all will have to tell me if I mess it up. Um, so, <laughs> okay, good deal. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Paige Looney. I'm with the West Virginia Coalition to End Homelessness. I'm a housing policy specialist, um, and I'm also transitioning to a role within our HMIS team as more of a data specialist as well. Um, I'm excited to be here today to talk to you all about rural homelessness, um, some of the challenges we face in our work, and how the federal strategic plan will affect some of the work that we're doing. So first things first, wanted to tell you a little bit about our organization. Um, the West Virginia Coalition to End Homelessness is the lead agency in the balance of state continuum of care. Out of the 55 counties in West Virginia, we cover 44 of them. Um, we're the HMIS lead, the coordinated entry lead, SSI, SSDI outreach access and recovery lead. Um, we oversee DHHR homelessness assistance funding for the contract shelters statewide. Um, we're the YHDP lead, and we also do education outreach and advocacy for fair housing, homelessness policy, housing policy, basically wherever the need arises. Um, in addition to this, we're a direct service provider. Um, we're the largest direct service provider in the state, which is very fortunate because the feedback we get from the folks on the ground feeds directly into the policies that we implement. Um, we do street outreach, coordinated entry, rapid rehousing, permanent supportive housing, mobile recovery services, youth and family navigation, and housing programs as well. This is a map of our catchment area. Pretty much anything that's not in that brown, um, which is basically... Charleston, Huntington, and Wheeling is the area that we cover. Um, some of that includes Morgantown, um, parts of the Eastern Panhandle, which are the more, I'll say, urban parts that we cover, which isn't necessarily true. And then the Southern part of the state, which is significantly more rural. Um, so Joe, you shared a little bit about national point in time count trends. Um, our data for the most part is reflective of those trends as well. Um, these are the numbers from 2010, 2017, 2020, and 2023. Um, I also wanted to pull up the point in time count uh, tableau chart that we have from 2016 to 2013. Pardon me, 2022. That was just absolutely wrong. Um, okay. Are you all able to see this as well? I'm hoping you can yes, see. Yes, we are. 
Thank you so much, Keegan. <laughs> um, as you can see here, um, our total homelessness has remained relatively steady since 2016. Our unsheltered homelessness has increased. And if we go to this next slide, um, our chronic homelessness has also increased since 2016, um, which is pretty consistent with what we're seeing nationally. Veteran homelessness has gone down. Youth homelessness has remained relatively stagnant, but um, yeah, so the data that we're tracking is relatively consistent. Um, some not very fun facts about rural homelessness. Um, more people than ever are moving from rural areas to urban areas. Um, more people than ever are leaving West Virginia. Um, from 2010 to 2020, the population dropped 3%. Uh, we were one of the only states to lose a congressional seat following 2020. Um, folks in rural West Virginia generally have a higher poverty and unemployment rate than folks in urban West Virginia. We've got lower high school graduation rates, lower average income, um, and we generally view homelessness as an urban issue. In addition to that, um, rural areas generally have a lack of reliable infrastructure. Um, there's not a really robust public transit scene in Logan, West Virginia, if anybody's been. Um, cell service can be spotty, rarely is there high-speed internet. A lot of the units that are available are rarely ADA friendly. There's a lot of food deserts within rural parts of the state. Um, if any shelters are available, rarely are they low barrier. Um, in addition to that, the impact of climate change has kind of affected the housing situation within West Virginia. If there's affordable housing available, generally speaking, it's in the floodplain. Um, despite that, we've been doing this work for a long time, and so we've found some successful strategies to kind of work in rural communities. The biggest one being just meeting people where they're at. We have a really comprehensive street outreach team. Um, for the most part, they're folks that live in the communities that they're already serving. They know where people tend to hang out and congregate, so they go to them. Um, we can connect folks with supportive services that they might not be aware of due to some information gaps. Um, we've implemented a landlord liaison program in both the southern and northern parts of the state to connect with landlords who'd be willing to work with us, provide incentives. Um, we've gotten pretty good at community engagement and partnership building. And in addition to that, we've just had to remain committed to flexibility because as soon as you think you know what you're doing, a pandemic happens. Um, as far as some trends in rural homelessness that we're seeing right now, um, this will shock you all, but a lack of affordable housing is probably one of the biggest barriers that we're seeing. Um, according to the National Low Income Housing Coalition, 33% uh, of renter households in West Virginia are extremely low income. So they spend more, their income is at or below the poverty line. And of those extremely low income renters, 66 spend more than half their income on housing, 66%. Um, the rural rental market is incredibly limited. Um, generally speaking, there's just like one guy who owns the units in the county and you're like, oh, that's the guy who owns the units in the county. Um, there's very little incentive to rent to low-income households or the folks that we work with who are experiencing homelessness. Um, very rarely are these units accessible. For example, when we did a brief street outreach stint in Logan County, we did case management for this one guy and his unit was up three flights of stairs just on the hillside. And so obviously if you're a person who uses a wheelchair, that's not gonna be an accessible unit for you. Um, this lack of affordable housing is probably the biggest barrier that we're encountering right now when it comes to actually housing our clients. Um, in addition to that, the political climate in West Virginia is not always very kind to folks experiencing homelessness. Um, this most recent legislative session, a bill was passed that's requiring the Bureau for Behavioral Health to conduct a study um, assessing homelessness demographics. Um, the specific questions they ask are whether West Virginia homeless populations concentrate in certain places and why, um, a determination of percent of homeless that live in another state or jurisdiction in the past three years, and an analysis of whether any health or human service benefits offered in West Virginia attract homeless or at-risk populations. Um, my take on this is that it's just seeking to confirm misconceptions that some of our lawmakers already have in place. Um, a lot of this data we already have. We know that 82% of the clients that we serve are already local to their community. There's this misconception that we're busting them in from Ohio or Kentucky or something, which is just not true. 
Um, and I can promise you that any HHS benefits and offered in West Virginia are not attracting folks experiencing homelessness. Um, additionally, as noted by Joe, some of these barriers that we're seeing are just criminalization of homelessness, some really harmful rhetoric. Oh no, um, oh no again stigmatization. Um, and my boss used the term permissive cruelty the other day, which is a pretty good way of defining how we're treating folks experiencing homelessness right now, especially from the legislative standpoint. Um, in addition to some of this political climate, we've had a pretty serious pushback against harm reduction. In 2021, uh, the legislature passed a bill severely limiting the scope of clean needle exchanges. Um, and I'm not going to say it caused, but it certainly exacerbated the HIV outbreak in subsequent months in Kanawha County, which is where our state capital is located. Um, there's a lot of fear that that prevalence of HIV has and will spread to more rural areas, and there's less testing and less access to clean syringes, so that is also exacerbated. Um, we're also noting a pretty severe client need that we as an organization can address. Um, as noted in the PIT numbers, there's been a rise in unsheltered and chronic homelessness over the past few years. Uh, we're seeing a lot of clients with severe mental illness. Uh, this is not an actual statistic, but we're thinking probably one in four clients that we see are in, in active drug use. There's a big prevalence of polysubstance use. Meth has made a comeback. Um, as you all know, fentanyl is in everything, and those cuts to harm reduction makes this work a lot harder. Um, and as a result, our direct service staff is not equipped to handle a lot of these situations that they see on a daily basis. You know, their job is to locate housing for people, keep people housed. Um, and unfortunately, they're asked to be emergency responders and clinicians and recovery coaches. And as a result, that leads to a lot of burnout. Yes, okay. Um, so on top of that, I'd like to talk a little bit about how this federal strategic plan that Joe so kindly went over affects some of the work that we're doing in rural West Virginia. Um, as he noted, there are the three foundations of the federal strategic plan, um, equity, data, and evidence, and collaboration. As far as how this manifests in some of the work that we're already doing or trends that we see, um, the equity component is incredibly important. Uh, West Virginia is kind of treated since it's a majority white state, it's treated as an only white people state. Um, so we've got Black West Virginians who make up 3.5% of the population, but 13.5% of the homeless population. So there's a huge overrepresentation there. But because we're treated as a white monolith, we just operate under the assumption that no non-white person exists in the first place, which really limits any access to services in the first place. Um, one of the things we've been prioritizing when it comes to equity is working with people with lived experience. That was a big um, key component of our application to the YHDP grant and continues to be relevant in the work that we're doing just on a daily basis. Data and evidence, um, we're using data as the key metric for reducing and ending homelessness. Um, that's a big component of this next piece under collaboration, which is the Built for Zero initiative. We're partnering with Community Solutions, which is a nonprofit nationwide with the goal of reaching a functional zero among the chronically homeless population in our balance of state. Essentially, people are exiting the homeless response system at the same rate that they're entering the homeless response system. Um, a big part of that has been ensuring really wonderful data quality and then fostering new partnerships and strengthening existing ones with folks across um, all sectors. Anyone who encounters homelessness can function as someone who can respond to it. Um, in addition to that, our goal for ending chronic homelessness is July, 2025, which is a good target date with this federal strategic plan. Um, in addition to that, those key solutions, scaling up housing supports, improved homelessness response and prevention, um, some of the work we're doing as far as scaling up housing and supports right now, Senator Manchin awarded $1.7 to our organization to rehabilitate and build units in Barber and Harrison counties. We've never actually done housing development before, so this is dipping our toes into completely uncharted territory, but we're looking forward to it, and it's definitely much needed. Um, we've also been working on developing master leasing around Monongalia County, which is Morgantown, 
um, that's probably where the highest concentration of potential units would be. And so we're trying to develop a response to that. Um, improved homelessness response. One of the components of this Built for Zero initiative that we're working on is case conferencing, not just with our providers, but with any provider that encounters folks experiencing homelessness. So that collaborative effort to tailor a housing response based on the person instead of just a kind of a blanket approach. Um, and prevention, we learned a lot from ERA. Um, we developed the Mountaineer Rental Assistance Program, the West Virginia Housing Development Funded. Um, and we learned a lot about how to distribute tenant-based rental, rental assistance and how not to distribute tenant-based rental assistance. Um, but that prevention component and eviction prevention especially has become important to our work. Um, things that I personally am excited about in the federal strategic plan, um, data sharing across partner agencies, that would be a huge help in closing the information gap, especially with the Department of Justice. Um, with discharge planning, we have a lot of folks exiting hospitals and prisons straight to homelessness and transparent data sharing would really, really help prevent that. Uh, the attention to marginalized groups, I think, is really important. Uh, despite, I think, our perception of the state, West Virginia has the highest per capita rate of trans youth in the country. Um, a continued commitment to housing first philosophy. I know there's been a lot of rhetoric kind of denouncing housing first, but we know that's the thing that works. Um, investing in the well-being of service providers. As mentioned, burnout is pretty prevalent within our organization, within just the field as a whole. Um, so taking their input into account is a really big deal. Opportunities for education. Um, as stated, the legislature has some misconceptions about what homelessness looks like in the state. And I think this uh, strategic plan could really help to bust some of those myths and a comprehensive collaborative approach. Um, as you guys know, homelessness doesn't exist in a vacuum. Um, the homeless response system can't continue to function as the very bottom of the social safety net. If you are a sector that encounters homelessness in some form or fashion, I feel like you have a responsibility to make that a part of the work that you do. Um, yeah, all in. And just some final thoughts. Here are some pictures of the state. This is my home. Um, I love the state and I love the people that live here. We have this cultural idea in Appalachia that we take care of our own and that's largely true. But if we continue to dehumanize people experiencing homelessness and treat them as other, we neglect that cultural responsibility. Um, the state is full of kind, resilient, and innovative people who are deserving of robust, comprehensive services. Um, and I think those services are offered in the federal strategic plan. But hopefully this resonated with you all. I appreciate your attention. And I'm going to hand this back over to you, Keegan. Thank you so much, Paige. That was wonderful. And I really appreciated the balance of a community-based perspective and the high-level federal perspective. And I think... Now we will transition into Q&A and hopefully we can continue that balance between a, a nationwide perspective and a community-based perspective. So starting here, I think this is relevant for, for both of you. Um, one of the first questions is how to get support for our work in rural communities. Um, this person's asking from Maine, but also in states and communities across the country. Um, so maybe Paige, you could speak to some uh, some resources that your organization taps into. And then Joe, you could share, uh, Dr. Savage, share some uh, federal resources that are available to organizations doing this kind of work on the ground. Um, Keegan, I'm so sorry. Could you repeat the question? Yes, um, support resources for doing this kind of work in local communities. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, especially in rural communities, we've had to get pretty creative. Um, if there's not a shelter available necessarily, trusting in local churches and some people that do just general community outreach. Um, we've had to get creative with other, you know, service providers that specialize in substance use because sometimes their clients overlap with ours. Um, we have had to get creative with partnerships with hospitals if they tend to encounter folks in the ER that are experiencing homelessness. Um, largely just partnership building has been the best resource that we've been able to offer and leaning on some of the other folks in our community. I believe that's helpful. That's great. And are there some primary state and federal resources that you also lean on to support your work? Um, definitely DHHR within West Virginia. 
Um, we've done some good work with the National Low Income Housing Coalition in the past as far as providing some educational resources. Um, housing and urban development, especially within fair housing, has been helpful for educational resources as well. That's great. And Dr. Savage, maybe you could share some federal resources that are available and how folks can tap into those. Sure. Uh, two things. Um, definitely uh, make use of your senior regional advisor. Although we are at the federal level and we cover um, wide geographies, our work does extend down to individual um, organizations, whether it's the CDC or CBO or homeless service provider. So we are here to help you maximize uh, the resources that are available to you or even find out what additional resources um, you all can tap into. And then also, if you all are coordinating and working uh, with your COC, um, your COC can always make a request to HUD for technical assistance for pretty much anything related to your homeless uh, crisis response system. And HUD will provide that technical assistance through um, a TA provider uh, for free to your communities. A lot of communities don't know that that a COC can request um, technical assistance um, from HUD. So definitely making use of your senior regional advisor, tapping into um the HUD uh, technical assistance um, through your COC can also give you resources and also advocating for your state's housing trust fund to really make sure that it sets a homeless preference in terms of its funding, as well as your state's qualified allocation plan when it comes to uh, the low income housing tax credit program and really advocating to have um, a homeless preference um, even included in the qualified allocation plan. That's how you can get more dollars, you know, um, at the state level. And I was going, I'm trying to put a link to the senior regional advisors, but I don't think I can post Keegan in the overall chat box, but I did put I it think, in there. I think that's been enabled now. Um, thank okay. you for that. And those are great tangible resources from both of you. Thank you for sharing those different ways to engage in advocacy and, and tap into resources that are available at the state and federal level. Um, so thank you for that. So next question, um, Paige, this one's for you. Could you talk a little bit more about the Landlord Liaison Program? Yeah, actually, coincidentally, I think our Landlord Liaison is actually in the call right now um, or in the chat. So she might be able to offer some additional support as well. Um, we've been working with a software called Padmission, the goal being kind of using it as Zillow, but for homeless service providers. Um, in addition to that, it's just been a lot of on the ground relationship building with landlords that we've worked with in the past, um, landlords that haven't worked with us, landlords that have worked with us and no longer work with us, and just seeing what incentives or um, anything we can provide that can get folks on board and continue to work with our clients. Um, yeah, I'll actually see if Jackson ends up sending anything else in the chat, but that's a basic overview. Hey, so could you provide them with info on how you all fund your landlord liaison program? Mm, that's a good question. Um, actually don't have the answer to that, but I can get back to you on that one if that's okay. Okay. No, I just wanted to say, because a lot of people are interested in how that gets funded. And, you know, what I've seen in most communities, they're either leveraging dollars from the philanthropic community or um, local dollars um, from their state government. So just really trying to look for where you can get those um, extra dollars to fund um, a landlord um, incentive of some type. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And relatedly, Dr. Savage, are there other strategies that involve working with local landlords within the federal strategic plan? Um, I would have to look specifically in the plan. Landlord engagement is mentioned in a broad sense, but it doesn't break out into specific strategies. However, on our website, we do have um, documents and resources that are specific to landlord engagement. So if you went to our website and typed in landlord engagement or landlord recruitment, you would find specific documents that really highlight strategies for um, engaging landlords. And I like something that um, Jackson Strunk put in 
uh, the chat box, recruitment, retention, market research, and marketing. Those are all very key when it comes down to um, landlord engagement. And we've also found that landlords are more likely to engage even when you just show some level of appreciation, whether it's a landlord appreciation breakfast of some sort. And then what we've also found that works with the communities in terms of specific strategies, that housing search specialist that your community is using, if it's someone who really has experience in the rental or the housing market, in the real estate market, that also um, works out well for communities. But you can get those specific strategies on our website. That's great. Thank you. Um, Dr. Savage, we have another question for you here about what happened to the 10-year plans to end homelessness. Um, are there any reports talking about outcomes from that plan? And they concur that 25% in two years seems like a, a reasonable goal, um, but they are curious to learn more about what's happened with, with past goals. Sure. So a lot of the 10 year plans to prevent and end homelessness were developed at the state and local level. So states as well as local government developed 10 year plans. I remember when Philadelphia developed their um, 10 year plan. So any reporting out on the progress from those plans, you would have to either go to the state's interagency council on homelessness website. Usually the state ICH lies within like the housing finance agency or um, the Department of Human Services at the state level. Go to the state ICH's website to find out um, what their progress was or go to the local COC or even the local government's um, website to see progress. At the federal level, we never had a quote unquote 10 year plan. We've had various strategic plans and in the past, we've set specific goals for me decreasing veterans homelessness, uh, family homelessness by subpopulation. And to be honest, we really found that a lot of communities found it difficult to meet those goals by 2016, by 2020, by 2022, um, et cetera. But as I mentioned before, with this new federal strategic plan, we will be releasing an annual performance plan to let you guys know how we are um doing as far as the metrics are concerned. But look at the local level and at the state level to see if you can find those plans, yeah. That's great. And love that you'll be doing this annual report that's publicly available and, and tracking progress. Um, and related to data page, the, the dashboard, there's a question if it's public facing and if so, do you feel that that has helped with community buy-in for any of your work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the data is, public facing for the most part. And I can actually share that link in the chat later. Um, and as far as just transparent data sharing, data sharing, that has probably been the thing that has gotten the most community buy-in. Currently beyond just like the point in time count, what we're trying to do is have more of a real time tracking of folks who are experiencing homelessness with this Built for Zero initiative. The goal is to have a by name list, which is just who is currently experiencing homeless who is currently experiencing homelessness in your community um and as far as building those community partnerships that has been the biggest component in keeping people interested and keeping people up to date that's great thank you um there's a question here about outreach teams and maybe what their role is and how they can be effective um, I was trying to find the actual, yeah, um, our rural outreach team provides them what's on about, um, our outreach team does a lot, <laughs> um, when asked, largely it's just trying to reach folks who are experiencing homelessness on the ground at the time, um, we generally provide them with information, try to get them enrolled and registered in HMIS, so if you're experiencing homelessness at the time, we can get you on the road to being housed, um, we can also connect people with other services if they're seeking them. If you're looking for substance use treatment or methadone clinics or something in the area, generally speaking, our street outreach team are the folks that are able to hook you up with those things. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm looking at the chat as well. Mary Morgan uh, noted Built for Zero as well. That's quite exciting. Um, hopefully that answers your question. And I'll just say real quick, you know, um, a lot of communities have uh, various providers who are doing outreach, and a lot of times those outreach teams aren't communicating with one another. So if the, your community has more than one outreach team, 
making sure that they are meeting and coordinating their outreach efforts, whether it's, you know, making sure they're coordinated by geography or even shifts during the night or during the day, et cetera. That coordination is really key to an effective outreach. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Um, there's a question here about master leasing. What is it? And maybe if either of you could elaborate on that or other strategies that local organizations can take related to housing um, in general and producing and preserving the housing stock in their communities. My understanding of master leasing is essentially working with um, a landlord to sublease the property. Um, the owner retains the legal title, but you kind of are the landlord as it counts. And so we would have discretion to lease to our clients and folks experiencing homelessness first. Um, that's new for us. We'll let you know how it goes. Um, obviously, we don't have like a ton of units, um, especially in more rural areas. So we're kind of doing a bit of a hodgepodge approach in some of those less populated communities. Um, but yeah, that's what I can give you right now. <laughs> And master leasing works in a lot of communities, especially when we talk about landlord recruitment. Um, it gives the landlords a better sense of confidence in terms of the care of that unit because it's that provider who is actually on the lease. And then the provider is committed to making sure um, whomever they sublease the unit to, they're getting the necessary um, services as opposed to a direct lease uh, with the uh, individual household. So they found it very effective. Then also with master leasing, uh, communities can get multiple units, you know, when it comes down to uh, master leasing that they can um, sublease out to um homeless households. So it is a very effective means of getting uh, multiple units and really uh, recruiting landlords. That's great. Super helpful. Um, okay, last question for each of you. We'll start with you, Paige. What are some of the unique challenges you face as a rural continuum of care? I think I kind of noted this um, earlier in the presentation. And honestly, Jackson's in the in the call and in the chat here as well. And she's based in Beckley. It could also probably speak to this quite well, but just basics like transportation, you know, if the only unit you have available for someone experiencing homelessness is two miles out of town, um, they have to walk two miles out of town and two miles back into town if their goal is to get a job. Um, that's probably the biggest barrier we see um, in the incredibly rural areas. Thank you. And Dr. Savage, final question. Um, what advice do you have for CDCs and community-based organizations to best support the implementation of the strategic plan in their service areas? And are there specific strategies that you think are particularly important for these kind of organizations to focus on? Yeah, sure. I would definitely say number one, making sure you're plugged in with your local continuum of care and that your CDC or CBO is at the table and a part of that conversation. And then another thing that I found, um, a lot of CDCs and community-based organizations, because they've been doing um, whether it's affordable housing, workforce development, or whatever other type of community and economic development activity, they've been doing it for a while. You all bring a level of expertise to the continuum of care that may not be there in terms of how to operate programs, how to make strategic use of resources. And then I'll also say a lot of times um, CDCs and community-based organizations have a better handle of data than what the COC may be getting. And you all can really serve as that resources. COCs have HMIS data and they have HMIS lead agencies, but they don't necessarily have statisticians or the human resource capacity to really do an in-depth analysis of their data. But CDCs and CBOs can bring that expertise and leverage their relationships with research entities and really bring that to the table. So just making sure you're plugged in with your local continuum of care, I think is very, very important. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Um, Dr. Savage, Paige, thank you both so much for sharing your knowledge and insights. We really appreciate it. 
Um, and for all of our attendees, thank you so much for joining this installment of our Raising the Roof webinar series. Please keep an eye out for the next webinar in the coming months. Um, thank you all for attending and being here and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Thanks.